Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast. Join Corbin and Alan, along with guest hosts, as they bring their love for the cinema to discuss films from every genre and decade. Learn about the history of the film, little-known facts, and insightful explorations while they enjoy discussing your favorite film. The curtain is rising and your podcast is starting. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your guide to the silver screen. Welcome back, listeners, to the second installment in our Terminator movie review series. Today we are reviewing Terminator 2, Judgment Day. This is your co-host, Corbin. And I'm Alan. Or you may know the film as T2, Judgment Day. That's an equally valid title. Yeah, or just T2. It's got yeah. a couple of titles, but they all mean the same thing. And everyone knows that's, what you're talking about. That's very true. Well, it's telling that Terminator 2 was a targeted release in July 3rd of 1991, which is a summer month, which would insinuate they're shooting for a summer blockbuster feel for the movie and hopefully box office revenue whereas it's it's very interesting the first terminator came out uh, late october yeah which is a weird time to release a movie in general unless it's unless it's a horror movie which we kind of talked about that it was so if you haven't listened to our review of the first terminator film then i highly recommend you go back and listen to that because i will say a lot of the groundwork James Cameron did in that film is laid and very much built upon in this movie. And I think you'll see our thoughts kind of evolve from that. Yeah. So of course, James Cameron is back directing. He's back writing. Uh, He doesn't have the same co-writer as last time. Um, That lady uh, produces like all of his films. Uh, He has William Wisher, who was kind of an uncredited writer for the first film. And then of course the, I would say more of an updated score and the iconic orchestral dun, 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 dun. That's Brad Fidel. He is here scoring this film. Right. Now, it did get an R rating once again, but I got to say, this is a much more uh, tame R rated film than the previous one, at least as far as nudity goes. Um, There's tons of action, though. So probably on, on the premise of action alone, they're like, whoa. So much action on screen, R-rated. Yeah, no, this is a film that, be, because of its action and how much violence there is in it, it got a pretty solid R-rating. I do believe there are a few more F-words than what would what the PG-13 rating would allow, but mm-hmm. yeah, probably could be a PG-13, um, could have been a PG-13 had James Cameron chose to do so. Yeah, it easily could have been a PG-13, I would say, and especially by today's standards yeah they'd have to work a little harder probably to get that r rating which probably not a good thing but terminator as i said opened in july 3rd of course it opened at number one at the box office with 31.7 million significantly higher than the first film it was number one and uh it didn't have a lot of competition everything else had kind of uh been in play for a while except what came in number two was the naked gun two and a half oh okay and kevin costner's robin hood prince of thieves was number three um academy award winning city slickers which that's always a shock every time i look that movie up i i own it in my collection love that movie and then of course what would go on to win best picture dances with wolves came in at number five ah yes so in 1991, it was an interesting year for cinema. Um, Silence of the Lambs came out, and that won Best Picture as well, of course, in different years. Right. Uh, Beauty and the Beast came out. Uh, Ridley Scott's Thelma and Louise. Steven Spielberg's Hook. Uh, Point Break with everybody's favorite, Keanu Reeves. Yeah, that had got a remake recently that did horrible in the box. <laughs> and that's why I didn't go see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what about Bob? A great Bill Murray, uh, Richard Dreyfus comedy. Star Trek Six. Now, remember, Star Trek Three came out um, when the first Terminator came out in 84. So they've oh. uh, they've made some movies in that time period. 
Yeah, they made a few, I guess. Where it took took a while just to get Terminator 2. Yeah. And of course, uh, Ron Howard's uh, Kurt Russell. Love this movie. Backdraft. Mm. So I would say overall, it's a pretty good year for cinema. Yeah, the 90s uh, was a great... The 90s, in terms of a decade, was also a great year for cinema because we got some of the greatest films, like like you just mentioned, Sons of the Lambs, The Matrix, uh, you Lord know, of the Rings. Can they, oh, yeah, Shaw Shake Redemption came out this time. A lot of really influential films that came out in the 90s uh, came out this decade. And, of course, it went on to go huge at the box office. Domestically, it grossed $205.8 million. And you know what? We said they had a $6 million budget last time. Yeah. They had a $102 million budget for the sequel. Yeah, I heard about this. I heard that they gave him like a bunch of money because of how much success the last one had. <laughs> so it shows. It shows uh, how much money they actually had to work with this time around compared to the previous movie. And it was also because James Cameron had become a force to be reckoned with particularly yeah. within the science fiction genre he could do whatever he wanted at this point because as we noted in our previous podcast um after the terminator he went on to do aliens which just blew everybody out of the water and yeah. then uh three years after that he went on to do the abyss which was groundbreaking in its visual effects and um, they did incorporate some of those like uh i don't know in video games, you would call it the engine. I don't really know what they call it in this particularly. The software, could mm -hmm. we say? Kind of Maybe. writing writing the software. is, And some of that is similarly used here in Terminator 2, which came out uh, just two years after The Abyss. So James Cameron was unstoppable. And if he would actually re-team up with Arnold Schwarzenegger three years later in True Lies. Ah, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, since the Terminator Aliens and The Abyss, of course, were the two films that if the Terminator didn't already put him on the map, those were the two that really solidified his position of, yeah, like you just said, a force to be reckoned with. Uh, especially Aliens, which is riding off of the coattails of one of, considered to be one of the greatest horror films of all time, Alien, uh, now turned into an action movie. It's no surprise how influential James Cameron would eventually become in Hollywood cinema. And even he became a worldwide success, grossing half a billion dollars oh, with this movie. man. And that's keep, ridiculous. Yeah, and especially in 1991. Um, today, we always talk about the billion dollar club, how the movie like has to hit a billion. Um, when you inflate these numbers from 1991, uh, it's huge. It did a massively successful um, and if I hadn't already mentioned uh, foreign, it grossed 15 million, I believe. Uh, those numbers don't add up. I think I meant to write 150 million. Ah, okay. That would make a little more sense because 15 million is pretty low for this movie. Yeah. It also caught the eye of the Academy. Yes, the Academy Awards. It was nominated. Now, now get this. A science fiction movie, big action movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, rated R. It, it received six Oscar nominations. Which is crazy. Yes. <laughs> it is crazy. And in, including film editing, cinematography, major categories there with that cinematography. And it would go on to win four Oscars, including makeup, visual effects, sound effects, and uh, just best sound. Right. And this would kind of be... I guess the expectation for James Cameron pretty much since the abyss and aliens and onward is his spot in, uh, at the Oscars famously Titanic got, um, nominated for 11, no 14 Oscars, which is the most you can get, uh, there at for the Oscars. And I think I walked away with, I think 11, I want to say either way he is at this point and can, in continuing on into his career, he would be it would be considered for him to be sweeping the Oscars or at least getting a large number of awards for his films. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely incredible. And this film, like its predecessor, has absolutely stood the test of time. Oh, yeah. It currently holds a a, a huge eight point five 
on IMDb. Which is, which is a super solid score. And last time we said the previous film currently sits at 241. Well, this film sits at number 37. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's up there with the big boys. Yeah. That's literally going nowhere. There, I don't see it leaving the list really at any time. No, uh, to sit at number 37, and it has been there every year since uh, the IMDb Top 250 list was instituted. Now, uh, critically on Rotten Tomatoes, it didn't do quite as well, but I mean, for Pete's sake, it's a 93% certified fresh, which is yeah. no small feat. No, there's no small feat, even though last week's podcast was 100%, which... Yes. Perfect. We were both kind of baffled about a perfect. Um, it's still a very respectable score. It's still considered fresh. So therefore, it's very good for Rotten Tomatoes. And audiences do like this film more um, on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, audiences, it's a 94 percent approval rating, oh, wow. whereas last week's was an 89 percent approval rating. As far as Metascore goes, a still very commendable 75. Not easy to get. But last week's was an 84. So significant right. difference on Metascore. Yeah, it seems critically Terminator 1, at least in terms of Rotten Tomatoes and Metascore, Terminator 1 seems to be a little more well regarded with the critics than Terminator 2. However, uh, they are both very, still very well regarded movies in terms of critical response. As far as cinema score goes, which is the official standard bear of what audiences think when they come out of the theater, it got an A+. That doesn't surprise me. It doesn't. And this might not surprise you either, but this is the highest rated film as far as cinema score goes in the franchise. Yeah, I believe it. Um, I mean, obviously, the first one, we talked about this here last week, the first one didn't have a cinema score. But considering what I know now, um, that is no surprise. Now, Alan... It's the early 90s. Okay, you're, let's say that you're a teenager. Maybe you're not old enough to go see an R rated movie yet, but I don't know. Maybe you are. So you see this trailer. What do you think? Are you going to be there opening weekend? So last week, I noted that um, the trailer seemed to really bend towards the horror side. This time around, it's completely different. It's totally in 100% on the action train and they really really play at least the trailer that i saw they really play up arnold schwarzenegger's role as the terminator and the one that i saw not just the terminator but also the good terminator which is completely backwards from last week so yeah considering what i was seeing in the trailer and what they were showing it did intrigue me a bit to so if i didn't if I had no context of any of the other films except for maybe seeing the first one and then seeing the trailer for this one now being released, it would intrigue me. I would probably, I might go and see it. I would probably go and see Terminator 2 because now that I've seen the first one, I would be curious to see what next they're going to do with the Terminator franchise now that technology has very much advanced since then. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's a completely 90s trailer, but it's pretty yes. exciting. Honestly, somewhat cheesy. It does give away a ton of the action and yep. one one liner. But dang, that trailer will get people in their seats and me in mine. Um, just just how much action they showcase within that trailer uh, would get me so excited, especially if, you know, I'm around... 13, 14, 15, even if I'm 18, 19, early 20s. Yeah, yeah. I, it would definitely appeal to me, and I'd be very excited to see it. Yeah. So once again, I didn't watch these movies in order. I watched Terminator Salvation first, and then I watched T2, liked it quite a bit, and then T1, and then the rest of the movies. Yeah. See, my my... For me, it was Salvation, T1, T2, which, pro if I remember right, probably happened within the same week. Um, oh, wow. And then Genesis, and that's it. So these are kind of out of order for me. 
Um, but now I'm watching them in order to kind of get because there's apparently a timeline that was that's been developing now um, that I was only kind of aware of when I first wa- started watching these movies. So now it's kind of interesting to see that timeline now fully developed from one to the very end now with this retrospective. And it's kind of funny because when I did see this movie back in the day, it, I'm hot off the heels of Terminator Salvation, which I saw in the theater. And then I picked up the Blu-ray and I watched it quite a bit. And then I watched this and I'm like, nothing can beat Terminator Salvation, not even this. And <laughs> in my, you know, teenage, young, young teenage mind, I was right. I was like, you know what? Terminator 2 is pretty good. Not Nothing is good as Salvation. So, mm-hmm. so that was my original thought. But I'm curious to see how my thoughts will change when we do get to Salvation in two weeks. Yes. I think the question on everybody's mind is why did it take so long to get a sequel? Because remember, Terminator 1 came out in 84 and this came out in 91. It came out in a completely new decade. It took seven years. Well, the production company on the first film, which was Hemdale Film Corporation, they owned 50% of the rights. So Arnold Schwarzenegger goes to his friend, Mario Kassar, which I was very surprised to see that name immediately because Mario Kassar produced a little film called uh, First Blood, which Ah. just so happened to be our very first review, podcast review on here. So Schwarzenegger goes to Kassar to bid on the rights to uh, fully own this film, to make the sequel to it, because Arnold has always been wanting to make a sequel to this franchise. Mm Mm-hmm. And, well, we weren't even a franchise at that point. It was a franchise in the making. So Kassar was, uh, he either owned or he was in charge of um, Carol Co. Pictures. And they ultimately paid $5 million to Himdale Film Corporation, which was quite a bit. Yeah. But, I mean, put it into perspective here. I, I want to say that... Amazon paid just for the rights of to make the Lord of the Rings a quarter of a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand Lord of the Rings is much more popular, but as far as paying for rights goes, it's they, they got a good deal, it seemed like. Oh yeah. Well, of course it's many years later and spoiler alert, Sarah Connor is pregnant at the end with uh, the first movie with John Connor. So they need a young John Connor. Um, As far as I could tell, Edward Furlong hadn't really acted before this movie. Yeah, I wondered how popular he was as an actor around this, around the 90s. Because he he kind of comes off as like the more mature version of uh, McCloy Culkin, who played in, you know, of course, starred in uh, Home Alone. But I don't know if I've ever really heard about any of the other projects he's been in. I got to say, he kind of looks like a Culkin as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I agree. Um, his acting career, he was kind of a one-hit wonder. I see he was in American History X. And looks like that's about it. I don't really know of anything else that is on this list. So, the year after this film came out, he was in Pet Cemetery 2. Ah. Which I yes. did watch... Almost all of it, as much as I could make through. <laughs> and I, I believe when we did our Pet Cemetery retrospective, so go back and listen to our reviews of Pet Cemetery because I do give a little bit, I talk a little bit about Pet Cemetery too and give my review That's right. of that. So Edward Furlong is new, but he comes on the scene and we'll talk about his performance as we go through it. But it should be noted this was the most expensive film at this point. I believe it. Um, considering, and this is kind of a staple for um, James Cameron too. His films are typically very expensive to make, which makes sense because of the product that he produces in the end. Kind of reasonably reasonable to have the amount of money that's given to him. Mostly Avatar. And it did top uh, Rambo 3, which came out in 1988. I want to say that production budget was $60 million. That was the biggest uh, budget of any movie at the time. Mm-hmm. So just a couple years later, it's gone up. And then a 100 to 
dollar production budget, a million dollars, isn't really that big of a budget anymore. I mean, that's pretty trending towards the lower side, I would say. Yeah, that's either lower or either. Yeah, it's about normal or a little bit lower than normal. Um, of course, now I think the most expensive picture ever produced, if it's not Avengers Endgame, it's, I, as I checked, it was Parts of the Caribbean at World's End, which was like 300 Fifty thousand or fifty million dollars, I want to say. Um, I did want to also note that most of the CGI done in this film is done by um, Industrial Light and Magic, which is especially through these decades the premier um, in visual effects. We talked about them uh, frequently on our Star Trek uh, retrospective series. Um, what what ILM did with the Star Trek movies, each each film was very impressive. And then what mm-hmm. they do here, we'll talk about the visual effects, but I found it to be quite impressive. Yeah. And they also most recently did in terms of what retrospectives we've done. They also did uh, Back to the Future, the oh, last yeah. two sequels. That's right. Now, on August 29, 2016, it was announced the film was going to be post-converted to 3D and re- released in 2017. Oh, interesting. Which is cool because those of you who know who have seen this film, August 29th is Judgment Day. Right. Um, I haven't seen it in 3D. I did miss out on that, unfortunately. Um, One of the things I did find interesting is for that release, they did actually digitally tweak the film. Really? Yes, they did. Which Cameron says, if I would have had the digital technology at the time, then I would have done it. So I don't really view it as this George Lucasian uh, really changing things. So um, I'm not going to give anything away, but when the semi crashes into the kind of the big ditch, you know, mm-hmm. you can see the windshields clearly falling out. But yeah. then when you cut to other scenes, the windshields are completely intact. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah I about that. So Cameron, Whenever Cameron watched that, he's like, the windshields fall out and then they're back on. And the producers are like, nobody's ever going to notice that. I got to admit, I didn't notice it. There's so much debris flying. I didn't mm-hmm. pick up that it was the windshields, but it was to him. So when they did re-release it, they digitally removed the windshields falling out. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. I wonder how good that post-conversion was because yeah. usually post-conversion 3D is not great unless you do it like unless you do a really really good job at it then it's good but usually post conversion 3d from what i understand is not great i'd be fascinated to see it yeah because there's a big difference between shooting a movie in 3d and then post converting it post converting it usually has quite a few issues and it's never as good and people often complain about that i think the thing that really surprised me about this is this film came out in 1991 and of course it was shot on film right and so they're converting a piece of film to 3d to a digital technology right i don't know how well that would work um i don't know because it's it's from two different eras of kind of film technology yeah it'd be interesting to see because of the film grain mostly i think um, yeah how they would work with that when they when they put it into a 3d engine as far as what the film looks like i know that um currently you can buy three versions of the film in one package the theatrical cut the special edition and the extended special edition and from what i read on blu-ray.com uh, i think the special edition comes with like a warning like the colors have been changed in this movie so it's not going to look like the theatrical cut which seemed really strange to me Hmm. I, I can't speak for it. I don't own it on Blu-ray. I haven't seen this altered cut of the film. I watched the... I did get to see the special edition for this. I don't know if I caught that warning. So according to Blu-ray.com, on the 4K release, Ultra HD release of the film, uh, here's what they said. Um, They called it a really odd duck. Hmm. So apparently they eliminated almost all of the film grain in the movie and tweaked the palette of the colors. And on a scale of five, they gave it a two and a half for video quality. And they said the Blu-ray actually has higher quality. 
I, all I know is that it's very the 4K is very controversial release, and most people will tell you don't buy this movie in 4K. And I did check um, that the special edition version comes with a warning that there are variations in the picture, color, and sound quality when compared to the theatrical version. Hmm. Well, listeners, if you haven't seen Terminator 2 Judgment Day and you don't want the film spoiled for you, which I recommend, don't have it spoiled for you, go ahead and click pause right now. Go ahead and watch the movie and come back and click play right here and we'll be ready to talk about it. Many years after the events of the first film, John Connor, played by Edward Furlong, Sarah's son is a young bratty preteen with a chip on his shoulder. See, his mother, Sarah Connor, reprised by Lyndall Hamilton, was arrested and institutionalized for trying to blow up a computer company because, as we know, she's trying to prevent a future with a nuclear holocaust. The doctors believe this crazed action to be brought on by her delusional belief that a robot from the future tried to murder her. Except the only problem is there's no evidence found of the Terminator she crushed in the factory. But that doesn't mean the Terminators have given up in the future. They send back in time a new creation prototype, the T-1000, played by Robert Patrick, a shape-shifting, seemingly unbeatable machine. Also, John Connor, in the future, sends back a reprogrammed T-800, reprised by Arnold Schwarzenegger, to protect John. The new, the old, and the young collide with the T-800 and John barely escaping the evil machine's clutches. The duo hatch a plan to break Sarah out of the mental hospital. They barely achieve this by the skin of their teeth. They flee to Mexico, where Sarah was headed in the end of the first film. There, we see where John grew up and was trained to become a warrior. But Sarah has other plans. She leaves John there once she learns from the T-800 that Miles Dyson, played by Joe Morton, uses the equipment left over at the Cyberdyne factory from the original Terminator, which the company successfully covered up, to create what eventually will become Skynet which will lead to nuclear holocaust, the downfall of humanity. Sarah becomes a Terminator of sorts herself when she attempts to assassinate Dyson. John and the Terminator stop her. After convincing Dyson about the future, he decides to, with them, destroy the leftover Terminator parts in order to alter the future. Unfortunately, they meet heavy resistance, which causes Dyson to lose his life, but not before he can blow up one component of the Terminator machine. John, the Terminator, and Sarah flee with their lives, but are quickly tracked down by the T-1000. After a massive car chase, they end their fight at a metal factory with smoldering pots to burn down the materials. Fortunately, this super-hot liquid is perfect for destroying Terminators. The trio successfully and finally defeat the T-1000, but they come to the sad realization the Terminator's mission is now complete. Therefore, he must be melted down too. John is distraught over this because he's not only losing a friend, but also a father-like protector. As the Terminator melts away and Sarah and John hit the road once again, she realizes her hope for humanity, if a Terminator can learn to appreciate the value of human life, as credits roll. If there were ever a movie that fit, that perfectly fit, and maybe even defined the definition of a sequel, I would say it's probably this movie, because... In pretty much every area that I can think of, it takes what was the first movie and then expand, not only expands upon it, but also greatly improves its source material. Um, and again, I think that's probably a good way of defining what a sequel should do is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. This is absolutely one of those rare circumstances where the sequel isn't ripping off its source material. Yeah. Cameron learned from what he made in the first film, and he absolutely improved upon it, um, not just with the writing and the pacing and the action, but he ups the ante with the T-1000 and kind of uh, does this really incredible role reversal. Where what we saw as this psychotic, you know, machine villain... Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first one he's now this like cool 
lovable protector of John Connor and you're completely on his side and you buy it. And yeah. I mean, it's amazing because there's no movie I could think of where like Michael Myers is somehow the good guy. Right. Uh, and I think the way they do that is because they humanize the Terminator in this movie while still maintaining a very like mechanical presence. Right. Yeah. They, especially in this opening too, they do a pretty good job at subverting your expectations because if you've seen the first one, then it, this opening feels all too familiar. Two characters are sent back in time. One of them has got to save the person that the other person is trying to kill. Right. So you would naturally assume that Arnold Schwarzenegger is the bad guy and uh, the T-1000 is the good guy, not only because Arnold Schwarzenegger was bad in the original, but he's also, the T-1000 also has, uh, puts on a uh, cop's uniform. So it would make logical sense that the T-1000 is the good guy and Arnold was the bad guy, but we don't get that answer until they all come to a head similar to in fashion to the nightclub in the first one, but this time at a uh, at a uh, arcade when we find out that that role is actually switched. Something that I feel the trailer kind of gives away. Um, I like that mystery of who is I like that uh, that role reversal here right in this in the scene where we find out that you know Arnold is actually the good guy, which kind of plays with the audience who's seen the first one because he was a very important enemy in that first one. And that's something I didn't quite remember going into this movie is that uh arnold would be the good guy now of course once it was all playing out i'm like ah, oh, yeah of course that's right he is the good guy and i believe henceforth he is not the bad guy except for maybe some small cameo scenes we'll talk about yeah i do think i love this choice of robert patrick as the t-1000 and there's such a contrast because um, the T-800 is a big, beefy bodybuilder, incredibly imposing, whereas Robert Patrick's a very kind of just average, normal-sized guy, yeah. not big whatsoever. But there's something about his face, just kind of this uh, mechanical menace and scowl he gives. But then at the same time, he interacts with people, whereas the T-800 never could. Right. And I do love that, where he is talking to young kids, he's talking to the parents, he is able to seamlessly blend in, whereas the T-800 in the last film sticks out like a sore thumb um, completely because he has no type of emotional interaction. By giving the villain emotions, I think that helps up the ante as well. Yeah, and it's not just like, you know, an advancement of te in technology that happens in the future where they send back a more advanced uh, cyborg to take out the leader but also there is an advancement in technology from the first film to now we know that there's a big number of years between the release of the second film when the first one came out and with that has come big technological advances i read that uh the idea for the t-1000 was originally in the script for the original movie but wow. was taken out because of technological limitations um, which they, he, of course, James Cameron then brought back with this one. And the T-1000 is a very iconic villain, this uh, this thing that can melt into this, I guess, metallic puddle or become other things because it can, you know, it can shapeshift. So, yeah, it it's really cool to see a movie in 1991 uh, take what was a brand new technology, CGI, and implement that in a way that isn't as... Uh, what well, would become, I guess, uh, so in your face about, hey, look at what we can do. Um, clearly, they know their limitations and they try to keep that uh, keep that in mind when they make this, when they show the T-1000 shape-shifting and things like that. That is one thing about James Cameron is he always has these really grand, big ideas, mm -hmm. but he's n he's not always quite able to execute them on the screen in a plausible way. And you're exactly right. So between that time period it wasn't just the rights to the movie it was also how can we realistically bring this new uh, terminator to life and not yeah. uh, make it look like some disgusting stephen king lawnmower man uh garbage <laughs> yeah um and you know i think i I've, I've heard the same thing like cameron had the idea for avatar back in like the late 90s or early 2000s 
Right. And the technology just wasn't there yet. So he always has this like, he doesn't, he's never been one to make a lot of films, but he does have this incredible patience where he's like, I have a vision. If you're willing to wait, it's going to pay off. And right. it absolutely does pay off in this movie, even though this movie is 29 years old, it's coming up on its 30th anniversary. Mm. It still looks great. Yeah. This movie, it got a cinematography nomination and this movie cinematography, cinematography wise looks really, really good. Um, in terms of its CGI, it's definitely noticeable. And this is kind of one of my, I guess, a critique of the film that I have. The CGI that they use is definitely noticeable. And there are times where they do show it off because it is a new technology. Um, and it's very clear that it's, you know, not real. But they do hold back. They don't like, they don't do, they don't pull a Phantom Menace out of the use of their CGI and make it and make full characters that are working with the live action ones so often that it completely pulls you out. It's not something like that. They don't use it overbearingly, but they do show it off. And being as old as it is, it, this age is beginning, this age is already showing. But again, for the time that it came out and for what they were able to do, it's very impressive. One of the things that kept me in the film and didn't pull me out is because oftentimes they would kind of introduce a CGI element, but then quickly transform that into a physical prosthetic. Yeah. Um, so for instance, the T-1000 often has like spikes uh, in his hands or like a hammer or something along those lines. And at first it's CGI, but then it becomes real. And so I think Cameron is smart to not overuse that T-1000, um, especially when he becomes like a goo type substance or melts. I also think it's imaginative enough that I'm still completely pulled into the movie, even though it's not up to the standards of today's technology. And clearly yeah. you can see its age, even though for 1991, it's still highly impressive um, as far as CGI goes, which hadn't been used very much. It did win the Oscar for visual effects. And, I mean, that uh, makes sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, rightly so. It, it won because it kind of did pioneer some of these um, visual effects uh, usages. CGI uses is what I'm saying. So I liked it quite a bit. And I think that also has become very memorable. The metallic goo of the T-1000. They even did the THX uh, Terminator goo. So it's I think it's stuck with it as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very much a it's very much James Cameron. What would he would continue to do from here on out or even before this is pushing technology for what it is now, pushing it as far as it could possibly go until you kind of hit a breaking point where it literally just can't go any farther. Otherwise, things just are not going to look good. And he will continue to do this from for years. And so, yeah, this movie not only looks good, but in terms of its technological achievement is uh, really worth the Oscars that it that it received. Another thing I think Cameron did well was subvert our expectations because in the end of the last film, Sarah is going to Mexico. She's free. She knows what's up. Whereas we begin this film with this dilemma of her being locked up and mm -hmm. her son is in foster care and he's a brat. Um, I, I will say I like Edward Furlong's performance because he comes across just whiny enough to not completely get on your nerves. Right. But he also does feel like a product, like that's how a kid would be in the 90s, especially with some of the lingo that he uses. Yeah. But trying to figure out a way to get Sarah out within the first act, I think was a smart idea. Yeah. Yeah, they, the, then, to that too, there is a relationship that is built between the T-800 and John Connor. And that's the thing that's probably brought mostly into the forefront is that relationship. We get to see, you know, once again, only this, this character who was this ruthless killer before and now kind of turn it around and be more of a father figure to this kid. 
but at the same time, you also they develop this friendship and this uh, more of parent and son bond uh, throughout this movie, which in today's standards is a bit more cliche than uh, than it was back in the nineties because. I was getting huge Iron Giant vibes off of this, but the Iron Giant came out <laughs> eight years after this movie. Oh yeah. So, so what I think it's is one of those movies where the cliches that are in here weren't completely cliches at the time that it came out, and I mean that uh, mostly in terms of this, you know, big brute of a thing that doesn't have too much of a human sense of personality, but develops this relationship with a human boy um, and becomes the more of a figure to them. You bring up a really good point with that of how the, f- the focus shifts from Sarah and shifts to the Terminator and John and how the Terminator's new priority is not to assassinate his mom, but to save her son. And uh, Cameron smartly kind of tells those parallel stories of Sarah is, you know, drowning in her perceived lunacy over there. And John is, you know, going straight to juvie. He's on the path Mm -hmm. when he is picked up by the Terminator. And I think they really come up with a brilliant, brilliant relationship there, Um, which, of course, I think is exceedingly well done by Arnold Schwarzenegger, how he does come across like this alien who doesn't understand our customs and John still has a conscience when he's like, you can't kill anybody. So when they're trying to break into the hospital, he shoots the guy in the kneecap yeah, and right. he says he'll live. Mm-hmm. Um, so he doesn't technically kill him, but he still has these very violent tendencies. But you're right. I really like the relationship between those two. And then they get Sarah on their side. But Sarah's character arc, I think, is is fascinating, actually, in this yeah. movie. Yeah, I agree. I think this movie is really what solidifies Sarah Connor as a very strong female-led character. This is the movie that really dives much more deeper into her character than the first film hardly touched at all, I feel. I I do like how much they go into not only the events of the first one, but how they have affected her, how much she's changed, and then then develop an arc off of that and show, you know, how much she is going, how much she has changed and how much she's still willing to change. And still, even at the point where she becomes a Terminator herself, you know, shows that she still has that human inside of her. I do really enjoy how much, um, how much character they put into the character of Sarah Connor here. I think that this one is mostly a character story, whereas the last one was a horror thriller. This one is more of a character piece, I feel. That's the deepest aspect that struck me with this movie is when Sarah is attempting to assassinate. um, Well, what's his name? Yeah, when mm-hmm. yeah, when Sarah is attempting to assassinate Dyson and just utterly yeah. terrorizes his family and she becomes exactly what she hates. And I I found that to actually be very brilliant to incorporate that how she essentially takes over the role of the Terminator and she plays at their own game because the Terminator said we're going to assassinate you yeah. to change the future and she says, "Well, I'm going to assassinate a fellow human being who will lead to the machine's creation. And uh, the thing that struck me the most is she immediately goes to murder and doesn't even try and reason with right. him. Yeah, which exactly. We come yeah, to find out right after that do talk he's completely Miles, capable of being reasoned with, with the T-800. Is, in my mind, not only a great scene, but also a scene that I do take a little bit of issue with, mostly because the introduction to ca- to the character of Miles Dyson is rather weak, I felt. Um, he's mm. brought up at the beginning, and in the special edition, there's, a, there's an inserted scene with him, and then he isn't really touched until this scene uh, about halfway to the end. Um, but, again, it serves a purpose for... Uh, 
Sarah Connor's character arc, where yeah, she becomes the thing that she that she did that she the thing that she ran away from in the beginning, um, and how she how fast she fell into that, and how she comes to her senses and pulls herself out of that. But in terms of storytelling, it makes sense. But when you put it in an overall perspective, I feel this scene with Miles Dyson does kind of hurt the film for me a little bit. I do think that, especially yeah. when you hear the last line of the movie, when she says, I have restored hope in humanity when a Terminator can have hope and protect us because she immediately becomes very Terminator like because you couldn't ever reason with the Terminator and you seemingly couldn't reason with her. And so she really loses her humanity in this one. But her son is what helps bring back that humanity and seeing her son uh, with the father figure that he'll never have uh, kind of solidifies that for her. Now, I will absolutely agree. That's my biggest disappointment and criticism with this film is the importance, like the extreme importance of Miles Dyson, yet we don't know really anything about him. And Cyberdyne, we don't really understand that either. And especially becomes confusing yeah, when they talk I, about Cyberdyne and Cyberdyne Skynet was like the in the same to, sentence, but they're not uh, particularly Skynet. the same thing. Right. I think you're right. Um, and I really think that's somewhat of a missed opportunity there. Maybe they're trying, maybe Cameron's trying to recreate the first film where we don't know Sarah Connor. We just know she's important and we know we don't want her to die. I mean, the problem is we don't really know Miles Dyson and I do think the film does a good job of kind of villainizing him and getting us in the mindset of Sarah like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, then then he has to die if he's going to lead to lead the death of uh, millions upon millions of humans. Um, but then it does kind of bring that reasoning back to it. I just wish that it wasn't so sloppy. His introduction is sloppy. And um, when the guy comes in and he says, can can we take a – you got to sign off on that. They're going to do an experiment on the hand and the chip. And he said, where did it come from? And he's like, don't ask questions. Um, they just don't want us to ask questions. There needed to be much more exploration yeah, I feel into that if they why Cyberdyne is covering this up and what their plans Miles are Tyson for this. None of that's given any much credit. deeper into his character. I feel like that would have helped the film out, not just with again, this is already a character driven story, anyways. I feel like it would have helped it out a little bit more with one more added character outside of our trio and give more explanation as to the give more explanation and understanding to the events that have happened up until this point. Um uh, I, I think the special edition tries to um, introduce Miles Dyson a little bit easier because we have the scene in the opening, which I do think is in the original cut. But then we've also got this inserted scene where we go, we cut back to Miles Dyson and he's with his family before the ending scene where Sarah Connor attacks the family. So the special edition does a better job at introducing the character of Miles Dyson albeit he is a pretty weak character to begin with because there's not a lot of time not, not a lot of time devoted to him but it does introduce him i feel a little bit more a little bit better than the theatrical film the, the theatrical version does that being said a, i agree with you the character of miles dyson is a pretty weak link in this movie I'd really be interested to watch that uh, extended version of the movie because I would like to see a little bit more of his character set up. And also, yeah. isn't there... So one of the things I noticed in the yeah. trailer is Kyle Reese is so talking to in Sarah the extended edition, in the trailer um, of the movie, which there is I'm like, scene, wait, what? Uh, That's not in the you movie. You know the scene later on, I think it's when they were in Mexico, when... Um, Sarah has like a vision and she's walking and she goes into a playground and she's trying to warn everybody about, you know, in the playground and she sees herself in the playground and then the bomb goes off. That same scene happens, but it happens much earlier on when she's in the hospital. She has a right. dream sequence where Kyle Reese comes and visits her 
and uh, then he oh. walks down the hallway and she starts chasing after him and then walks through a couple of uh, some double doors into a playground. Um, and then the same thing happens that happens later on. So that's the whole sequence is, uh, yes, he was in the extended mm. cut. He is in the movie. Wow. I don't really see a point for it. It's more of mm. just set up for what would happen later. Um, uh, later with this is pretty much the same scene. So I can see why it was cut originally. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that would be where you would see Kyle Reese is in the extended cut. One of my biggest criticisms of the Terminator franchise in general is never understanding how any th- any of uh, this came to be, how Judgment Day came to be, or Skynet came to be. I feel like this film, well, yeah, it this film like, uh, does have an explanation, like right? Explain it's just everything. not given much um, time at all. Pretty much just in pieces. Mm. I know, and that expedi- that exposition dump really bothers me. Yeah, there's a lot and of Sarah narration. Not to mention, in uh, I think there's isn't it kind of cut? done by Sarah's um, voiceover? It's another one of those things where it's. I don't feel the narration is completely necessary oh, in every scene that it's in, um, because there's enough context I feel within the film to be able to remove it in some of the, some of those moments. But yeah, a lot of the exposition is given to us over narration from Sarah. And that I more than anything, more than the CGI, I was more so taken out by her narration than um, and I remember I just watched the theatrical cut. So her narration really didn't come into play, at least noticeably for me, until they were in Mexico. When all of a sudden she just starts monologuing right to us about how she realized the Terminator would be the best dad John could ever have, or something like that. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Like we don't need that at all. We get it. Um, to me, it just seems like a holdover from when Sarah was recording tapes for John, which, as far as I can tell, those tapes yeah, they didn't never bring them back from the first meant one. anything, they never came into play one, they, in, uh, within the sequel, at least within this here. movie. Mm-hmm. It might have been nice if we would have had a scene of John listening to those tapes, like in his room. Or throwing them away or something like that. Um, I don't know. That just seemed, that really just seemed out of nowhere. And I understand how easy it is for them to convince Dyson because right. um, Arnold pulls off his, the skin of his hand to show his mechanical hand, which is what they have at Cyberdyne. I guess I just don't understand. Dyson doesn't even know where this terminator equipment came from he said just don't ask that's what they told me when i was first wondering about it so to me it seems like they would have somebody maybe a little more nefarious or a little more in the know-how about this equipment because ultimately he just uses that as a blueprint was to understand create self-aware artificial intelligence Uh, what what they find pretty much they find the brain of the uh of the Terminator at that site. And it's from what I understand, it's his job to look into it and figure out how to make this fully operational with today's technology. Um, That's more or less his role in that subplot of the wreckage found at the site from the first one. I think the film doesn't do a very good job of yeah. getting us to realize that he's going to be massively important later on and he's the one that does it. He's just a character. I mean, I almost want to equate him to the level of um, Newman's character in Jurassic right. Park, who's just the nefarious one hacking their computers and stealing their cryo stuff. I feel like he has a very similar kind of introduction and in, yeah not given a whole lot of time as to who he really is. So that's definitely one of my biggest disappointments with the film. I think they're too wrapped yeah. up in creating nonstop action. And the funny part and is my criticism of like, T2, well, we my gotta go quick, 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 quick. And this is again, <laughs> writing off it. of me watching the special edition, not the theatrical edition is I feel the exact opposite of you. 
uh, I feel this movie, the special edition, is way too long and has way too many scenes dragged out oh, wow. and not enough, uh, not enough scenes that I feel oh, are okay. more exhilarating. <laughs> Not necessarily more scenes that are action packed, but just scenes that I feel are more engaging because there are 20, there's 20 more minutes added onto this film, which is a lot of footage. So when your film is two and a half hours long and it's not one that I feel, especially when you have characters like Miles Dyson, who's introduced and then dropped and then later introduced and you have a villain that has the same kind of issue where it's, he's only in the, he's only in scenes where the script kind of calls for him. He's not really anything that is super well explored. And then you have all this lore being tossed at you every every other corner. It becomes a, an experience that I felt was very different compared to what I had heard. And so when I got to the end of this movie, when I was 30 minutes from the end of this movie, it was at a point where I just didn't care about what I was seeing because the movie had chugged for me so slowly and had been introducing these concepts to me that I just that weren't really engaging, that I started to completely lose interest in this movie. And so the entire third act for me was something that I just didn't really care about when it was all said and done, which is weird for me to say because this is a movie that I remember liking when I was in college. <laughs> and of course, you always hear about it because it's considered to be one of the greatest action films, if not the greatest of all time. Yeah, and even James Cameron himself said that the theatrical wow, that's cut really is interesting his because it sounds like the theatrical cut is the way to go. Then. And from what I remember, which again, this has been a few years since I've seen the theatrical cut, but from what I remember, the theatrical cut is a lot more tighter which, than the extended than the extended edition. I found it to be very well paced. I didn't really have the pacing issues that I had with the first movie. I was pretty much constantly engaged. I think they moved it along very well. Um, once again, my only criticisms, like I said, really comes in when they go to Cyberdyne and they easily convince Dyson that they just have to blow up the facility. That's the only way to do it, which kind of seems ridiculous and just kind of seems like they wrote themselves into a corner because I would say the more logical thing is to go the kind of spy movie route and have Dyson get it like during business hours and smuggle it out to destroy it. But that would just destroy the pacing of the movie. I uh, just bore everyone to tears. So I understand blowing it up yeah. is a very cool action route. It's just like, really? You have to blow up the building to, to do this. It just seems outrageous. And it also, yeah. Another time travel conundrum I have from I had a problem with the first movie. I have a problem with this movie is it seems like the Terminators never would have been created. Skynet would have never been made if they hadn't have traveled back in time and left their equipment because they said mm -hmm. Miles Dyson figured it out using yeah, yeah, it's something Terminator that technology, I which guess just was, creates this up being a mistake paradox. Of the, uh, of the doesn't Terminators make any because sense. They're not supposed to fail, right? That's like the whole reason that they're made. But then, of course, they do in the first one, which then leads to the events of the second movie and changes the timeline for the future yeah. a little bit. But yeah, it is it is something that feels a bit a little bit contrived. I, I guess I could say. <laughs> it just i don't know i guess i'm thinking too hard about it it just doesn't make any sense that how were they how was skynet created in the first place if they were okay maybe miles dyson it took him longer to figure it out or somehow but they're saying he created the blueprints based off of the motherboard from the terminators from the yeah. future so it's just a conundrum. It, it's a paradox. It's a circle that doesn't make any sense. And this is something that we both highly appreciated about Back to the Future is they were really tight and smart about how to create the time travel film. Whereas Cameron <laughs> is like, nope, surprise, the Terminators created themselves. And John Connor was created yeah. By yeah, his it, dad, I think that's that kind of why, back in time. at least part of the like, reason why what? I didn't enjoy this movie as much as I remember enjoying it. 
this is very much a Hollywood action movie. At its core, that's what it is. And at time, there are times where I can be fully engaged into something like this. A movie that is purely set on action and story. Um, the problem here is that you, and this, I guess the best example of this is when they have to blow up uh, Cyberdyne. Um, it, it feels like they're just doing this for the wow factor. Like this is the thing that they have to do because they want to have a big explosion and make the movie more exhilarating, which is fine. But I don't feel that it's something that is earned, especially when you have, again, a character like Dyson who sacrifices himself to do this. It doesn't feel necessarily earned in this context. And from here on out until the end of the movie, this is where I completely lost interest was this scene where they were attacking Cyberdyne. And then it eventually transforms into being chased by a helicopter, which is admittedly pretty cool to see a helicopter flying like two feet from the ground. Um, eventually back into a parallel of the first movie where they're in some factory and the way to kill this Terminator is within the factory. My, I guess my criticism of this movie is, uh, in terms of, of it being in a general sense is it is very much a Hollywood production. And that's kind of what James Cameron is known for. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the action. I thought it was a lot of fun. I think you can have fun with it because, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's over the top. Yeah. How would Sarah Connor have these weapons stored in Mexico in her underground bunker? Mm -hmm. Where do they get this stuff from? I mean, this is like crazy weapons, um, you know, mini guns. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's it's totally over the top, but... Um, it's very fun. I guess the way I would describe it is this, it becomes a video game at the end. It be completely becomes a video game where you're swapping out weapons, you're blowing everything up, you're trying to escape, someone's driving the car, you're trying to shoot them out. I mean, I would, I, honestly, this is the blueprint for how video games have become, Yeah, I would say. Um, so, I mean, I guess I like Video games, I like those kind of video games, so I did find some of this to be fun. It's an extremely long climax, mind you. Yeah. Extremely yeah. long. And so I guess I'll take back a little bit what I said about the pacing. 137 minutes just for the theatrical cut. Um, yeah, I was feeling it there towards the end where they're having to blow up Cyberdyne and it's not working. And then they go on the world's longest blow up chase. And then I think it takes them like three or four times to kill this Terminator before like it works that, yeah yeah and the other thing that kind of threw me for a loop is the t-1000 is pretty prominent in the beginning completely disappears for the middle of the film yeah and for me it felt like he was gone back. for like an hour it, it really did seem that way because he shows up at the dyson home to see the wreckage and i'm like man you're so far behind like mm -hmm. way far behind I, I don't know i don't understand where he went that whole time um, I guess I do like that they kind of have this like no uh, needless killing promotion with the Terminator. I guess that seems like admirable, especially when it does seem to market towards a younger audience and have that message. But right. I, I overall highly enjoyed the action elements of the movie. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. They're, the elements that are good in this movie are really, really good. The action of this movie is really great. And I mentioned a second ago, um, there's the one of the ending chases is they fly a helicopter like two feet off the ground and like maybe 10 feet from a truck. It's really cool action and what they were able to push and pull off even for 1991. But again, my I guess my biggest problem with this movie is not necessarily a problem of the movie itself, but more of a personal preference. Because when it gets to this ending, and it's pretty much just all action at this point for another 45 minutes and doesn't stop until the movie is finished, which comes to an abrupt end, um, I become exhausted. Well... I think that does it, Alan. What's your rating and recommendation for Terminator 2 Judgment Day? So there are good pieces to 
Terminator 2. There are really good pieces of Terminator 2, and I can see why it is considered to be one of the greatest. I don't really care for Terminator 2, and maybe if I watched the theatrical cut, my feelings would change on it. But if you like Terminator 2, I totally understand that, and I totally get where you're coming from. I just don't really care for this kind of movie. So, at the end of the day, 7 out of 10, I'll still give it a solid recommend because it is still a good film to me. Just not one that I would ever watch very often. Terminator 2 Judgment Day exceeds its predecessor in every way. With lovable and investing characters this time, reinventing the Terminator as a good guy, creating an even more undefeatable bad guy, downright incredible action sequences, jaw-dropping visual effects, along with memorable one-liners, hasta la vista, baby, there's no wonder T2 has stood the test of time. This is one of those rare cases where the sequel is so much better than the original. Now, don't get me wrong here, there is flaws with this film, as we just talked about. I think the storytelling flaws concerning Miles Dyson and his importance with Skynet and the paradox that creates... If you give it too much thought, you're going to be confused and frustrated and probably like this movie a whole lot less. So I think Cameron should have bolstered that storytelling aspect. I think that would have made this a stronger movie for me and invested me even more in blowing up Cyberdyne and Miles Dyson going along with it in a heartbeat. Otherwise, I really did enjoy this movie. If you want something really fun, it's it's funny. Arnold Schwarzenegger is funny. I like his relationship with John Connor and the trio, and I do find these action sequences to be video game-esque and over the top, but they're very well choreographed and very well done. And of course, the T-1000, the follow-up as that being a villain, I find that to be very memorable, and uh, I'm impressed with that. I do want to own this on Blu-ray, and I do, of these two movies, I would revisit this one again. So... Terminator 2 Judgment Day, it receives 7 stars out of 10 with, yep, a solid recommend. It's funny because we have the exact same rating, but totally vastly different opinions on that rating. Well, I would be curious to see if your thoughts would soften maybe a little bit with the theatrical cut because it seems like your cut was so bloated that it really did mess up a lot of things for you. Yeah, that's and that's... I. That's what I was wondering when I was making my uh, final re- final uh, summary is wonder if maybe if I went back and watched the theatrical cut that some of this would be cleaned up. Some of it isn't necessarily the length and the pacing of it all, though, as well. But it's possible. And I might someday go back and watch the theatrical cut to see if my if my opinion has changed on it, depending and on now- which cut I watch. And now I'm curious to watch the special edition and see if I would get bored with it as well or a little bit fed up with it. Because don't get me wrong, I think that's one of the things we're hitting on as a problem with both Terminator movies Mm -hmm. is they really struggle to wrap it up in a really clean, solidifying way. Yeah. It takes so long. And you're right, Alan, you pegged it on the head when it had an abrupt ending. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Just kind of ends once. Uh, once the once the T once the T eight hundred melts in the lava, it's like a short narration from Sarah, and then it just credits. <laughs> Bam! Yeah, yeah. and uh, kind of some very cheap looking like B roll footage where they're like, it's just close up yellow lines on a pavement at night. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that's a weird way to end this movie. And the shortest of things, it's like almost feels like a college student trying to find an ending to the paper and they hit the page limit or word count and they're like okay done yeah (laughs) Uh, it's weird but you know what if you own the blu-ray cut of this movie and maybe dvd cut with dvd i read you have to work a little harder you kind of have to input some secret commands to unlock it Hmm. you can watch the ultimate extended cut or whatever it's called where it does feature a more complete ending i guess i would say Hmm. so the final cut of this film with the alternate ending takes place august 29th 2029 in the future sarah connor is uh, very old and she's doing her narrations once again i don't know if she's writing it down or some futuristic recorder and she sees 
John Connor and her granddaughter playing at a park, Mm -hmm. which she saw was the nuclear holocaust. But this time, everything is fixed. They saved the future. Um, And John Connor doesn't become a soldier general. He becomes a senator and fights for the future and for people through like legislation and for hope. Um, so I would say this is actually a very into interesting way to wrap up the movie and probably a better ending. Yeah. It's interesting too, because that kind of puts a wrap on the Terminator series now. Yeah. Obviously there was a third one that happened <laughs> a few years after this, but it does kind of put a, a bow on this duology at this moment, uh, for the Terminator franchise. So it, I do like the ending that we have because it kind of leaves up to your imagination what is going to happen in the future, which kind of leads into that fate line, like fate is what we make it. Um, but it does feel like a more, I guess, a little bit more of a complete package with that alternate ending that you were talking about. I do think it's a much cleaner ending than the one we get. I do like that, as you said, it leaves this open because... There was no way the studio was going to let James Cameron put this ending in the film. Clearly in James Cameron's mind, this was the end, though, mm-hmm. because all of the visual effects are done. We see a very futuristic Los Angeles. Um, they did uh, old age makeup on Linda Hamilton. She looks very old. Yeah. She looks like she's dressed like she's Native American for some reason, which I don't understand. Strange. Um. She throws out this weird line where she says, um, August 29th, 1997 came and went. Judgment Day was averted. Michael Jackson turned 40. Uh, it was just like out of nowhere. It's like, okay. (laughs) Okay. Well, it was, it was odd. Um, so I can't say the dialogue's very good, but it is interesting to see that James Cameron was going to wrap this franchise up. And it is possible if you want to view this as a duology or just a self-contained duology, that's possible. And that's Mm -hmm. a rare thing. You can't always say that. So I think that's a really cool option. You can say, I just want this franchise to end with T2. And it does. Yeah, it's uh, from what I hear, the timeline from here on out gets really confusing really fast. I haven't heard pretty much anything about T3. But I know that Salvation and Genesis and what would become later on uh, Dark Fate kind of mess up the timeline a lot and make it super confusing. Um, It's been a while since I've seen those, so I didn't really have too much context as to what the timeline actually is for the Terminator franchise. So I'm kind of curious to see uh, what they're going to end up doing with these later movies. I'm very curious as well, because honestly, I don't remember... But I don't really remember a thing about Salvation, even though I've seen it the most. I remember very, I don't remember anything about Genesis. Um, and of course, I haven't seen Dark Fate yet. So I'm kind of hoping I don't hate them. <laughs> I'm, I really don't want to hate them. So I really hope they're pretty good. And of course, I don't remember anything about Terminator 3, except we get a female Terminator this time. Oh, do we? We do get a female Terminator. I don't know where we're going to go from there. Mm -hmm. But I do know that this film, as we said, was a massive success. And there was no way they were going to let James Cameron wrap it up. They're like, you dummy. We need to make this into a franchise. Like You have to milk the cow. You don't just put the cow to pasture after you get your two jugs of bottles of milk. So Marvel Comics issued a mini run of a Terminator series. and. In 1996, Cameron directed an attraction at Universal called T2 um, in 3D Battle Across Time, which had, uh, I believe, Linda Hamilton, Edward Furlong, and Arnold Schwarzenegger reprise their roles. Oh, wow. And I did actually see this attraction uh, many years ago when I was at Universal Studios. And um, it is an incredible ride. It's really fun. It's only... 12 minutes long but apparently this is the most expensive uh film ever based upon um how much it costs per minute Hmm. because it's only 12 minutes i don't remember how much it costs but apparently it was like 
it was like twelve million dollars, maybe. So it was like a million dollars a minute. Yikes! So it's it's got a serious production budget, and it's cool because they do have a very look alike Arnold Schwarzenegger actor um, come onto the stage, and Edward Furlong, and they start racing around. I highly recommend it if you're at Universal Studios. Check it out, and a lot of video games came from this. They made an arcade game, but they did make video games for a lot of the home consoles. They made trading cards, which, of course, was hitting its popularity in the 90s because mm-hmm. of Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! Those are huge. And they even made a novelization of this movie. Makes sense. I mean, for how big this movie it was, and still is, it would make sense that they would have... They would milk that merchandise cow until it was dry and then do it and then keep going until nothing came out. And you know, if this would have been PG 13, they would have made toys. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. But people were definitely thirsty for more, but Cameron decided to wait, not just for the next decade to come around, but for the next millennium. Mm Mm-hmm. The Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines did not come out until 2003, 12 years after this one. I mean, that's time for you to grow up if you were a kid and saw this movie. Oh, yeah. 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 That's a long time for a sequel to come out. And I would assume that most people thought at this point before Terminator 3 until, of course, they announced it that it was probably dead like that's it one and two that's all that that's all that uh was going to come out but then of course owners of the terminator series can't let that go to waste they can make more money if they make us another sequel make it a trilogy so we'll see how this holds up i'm really curious this is one of those bizarro circumstances where the first film comes out and then in order to complete the trilogy you have to wait about 20 years yeah, that's a long running trilogy. It is. And of course, it could only be done because James Cameron was so popular and he said, let's do Terminator 3. And of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger is super popular and he's going to help get it done as well. I don't know. I haven't done any research on Terminator 3, so I don't know. I think Cameron's directing. I don't know that for sure. I'm and looking I at it now. Okay. It is not, he is not, in fact, it doesn't look like he's really involved with the project hardly at all. He's credited Ooh. as a director, but only for characters. Um, okay. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. And Jonathan Mustel is the director. And hmm. Jonathan Mustel uh-huh. has done, he did a movie called Surrogates. He did a movie called U- 571. I've heard about that one. Heard of that. Yeah. And he did a movie called Breakdown. No one's ever seen it, though. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, so not don't get your hopes up for next week is what you're telling me. <laughs> kind of. Uh, I'm already, it, it's, if it isn't obvious already, I'm not too into the Terminator series. <laughs> and we're oh. only two movies in, and those are considered to be the best of all of them. So. Yeah. Go. I, I didn't even recommend the first one. So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm um, I'm intrigued what we get. Maybe Terminator 3 will be my favorite. I don't know yet. <laughs> Maybe it'll be your favorite, Alan. We don't Maybe. know. Maybe. Especially because you've never seen it. I've seen it. Mm-hmm. You've yeah. never seen it before. True. So I've, I've only seen it once, probably on AMC when it was on TV or something. Ah. Well, Alan, thanks for joining me. Sure thing. Don't forget to click subscribe, though, so you will not miss our review for next week when it does drop next monday so we will be back listeners with our review of terminator 3 rise of the machines hasta la vista baby Hey listeners, it's Corbin. Don't forget to check out the exciting links in the description below that will connect you with more great movie reviews for your listening pleasure and our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter page. And of course, our official website where you can read great articles and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Also, if you want exclusive bonus content such as extra movie reviews, movie commentaries, and our thoughts on the latest movie news and trailers, plus more, then check out our Patreon page. It's a great way to help keep this show free, and it gives you great content that's yours to keep. All of that and more is found in the description below. 
Don't forget to subscribe whether you're on YouTube, Apple, Google, or Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. And while you're at it, please leave us a five-star review so other movie lovers can more easily find our podcast. We love talking about movies, and we love talking about them with you. So don't forget to share with your friends and family, and we'll see you next week, listeners. The Silver Screen Guide podcast is edited and produced by Alan and Corbin. Intro and outro music is created by Thomas Rankin. The thoughts and opinions herein expressed are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent those held by Silver Screen Guide. Silver Screen Guide is not affiliated with any company or individual involved with the creation of this movie or TV show. No portion of the podcast may be used without express written permission from Silver Screen Guide. Shoulder shirt. And Gibby came to see me. Hello. It's one of those kind of bizarre circumstances where the first film comes out and then you have to wait. Uh, how long would that be? About, let me restart the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listeners, we'll be back with next week with, oh gosh, I watched it. <laughs> Let me redo it. <laughs> Let me redo it. Okay. All right, listeners. Wait, wait, wait. But make sure that you do subscribe so next week you won't re Why is it so yeah. hard? I got I got to be done. I got to go eat. I haven't eaten anything and I had a rough day. So. <laughs> okay, okay. I got it this time.